one of my proudest uh, moments is to work really hard on changing, changing that person and who you are and the way you teach. And you know, I'm proud to say I'm not like that anymore and I haven't been for a number of years. And see what makes your staff tick and how to get the, the most out of them has been such a, such a huge change. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Transformation. It's one of the key features of careers in hospitality. How the vision of how you see your career can change with the influences of different kitchens and the lessons learnt too. How different are chefs to the budding young cooks who first pulled on the apron? Clinton Park is the head chef of the Bridge Hotel in Werribee, Victoria. Clinton, how are you going? I'm good, thanks, Huck. How about yourself? I'm good. Uh, it's good to have you on the show. You've had a turbulent year like everyone, but um, you've moved states, you've closed businesses, you've changed careers, you've come back into hospitality. It's been a pretty pretty, pretty crazy ride. Yeah, look, it's been a roller coaster to say the least. It's, you know, pretty exhausting, but I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and yeah, life's pretty good. So, I mean, you know, pressure makes diamonds, I guess they say. <laughs> Well, you opened the Harlequin in Hobart not that long ago. It was still quite a young business, but you, you ended up closing that. Could you tell us about the challenges of, of, of bringing, bringing that to its end, but also you know, tell us a bit about it and what you created there? Yeah, look, to, to be honest, it, it's actually still trading. Um, the guys I was in partnership with decided to keep it going. Um, I chose to get out of it. I didn't. I mean, for a number of reasons, um, COVID being probably the, the biggest one, really. Um, but yeah, so Harlequin was, I guess, essentially a pub and the focus was cooking with fire um, and, you know, quite heavily meat focused. Um, yeah, so we built we built a lot of the, like, all the furniture ourselves. We did a lot of landscaping, like we ripped up part of a car park and laid 650 square metres of lawn ourselves. Um, yeah, look, it was a pretty monster feat. I think it took us a good 12, 12 to probably 16 months worth of manual labor between three of us to sort of get it to where it was. Um, I mean, painting all the walls, the ceilings, building every table and chair out of, um, like real, we repurposed all the furniture that was, that was there. It was all Italian blackwood. So we cut it all up into different shapes and rebuilt everything ourselves from scratch. So a lot of hard work. There's a lot of blood, sweat and, and tears that literally went into that. And the, the building historically is quite significant too. Yeah, look, it's a, it is a weird one. It's in this weird old castle um, in Lena Valley, which is just north of Hobart CBD. Um, yeah, so it started out as a, as a shed to build and service uh, fuel bowsers or petrol pumps. Um, then transitioned into um, a doll's house or it's a doll museum, sorry, um, where the, the new owner had bought it and decided that this shed, what this shed really needs is a few turrets out the front and to look a lot more like a castle than a shed. So um, this, I forget the gentleman's name, but he did that. Um, and then it changed hands again and... Um, the guy who then bought it decided, well, we better continue this castle vibe going and finished off the rest of the building and um, put turrets across, uh, on either side of the crossing of the river. So it, is, it looks like it's got a little moat. And yeah, so it's a, it's a bit strange. It's a bit um, bit wacky, but yeah, then we, we took it took it on. Um, most recently before we, we had it, it was actually a yum cha restaurant. <laughs> yes, bit of, bit of history there. Well, given that you put so much of yourself into that, was it hard to let go of it? Look, it, it was. Um, I found it pretty difficult. It was a really tough decision to to get out of it. Um, I think part of part of what made that easier um, was the fact that um, you know, as all business relationships go, they they're not always they're not always set to win and or, or set for success, and they're not always going to be the best partnership. Um, the three of us got along really well. And then obviously opening a, a restaurant is quite difficult and stressful. And I think along the way, there were a few decisions made from both sides, which kind of impacted that. And so that, that relationship wasn't actually going as well 
as I would have hoped. Um, and then COVID happened and there was the decision that had to be made with, um, you know, the financial commitment and responsibility that comes with owning that venue and going to unprecedented times and, you know, com the complete unknown of COVID and what that was actually going to mean and represent. How long was it going to go for? What was going to happen? Did we try and go on and then this is, you know, may have gone on for a lot longer as far as lockdowns and isolations and that are concerned. We're quite fortunate, but there was no foresight to or any way to predict the outcome. Um, and yeah, so I had a chat with um, well, my now wife, my partner at the time, and we we spoke about it and thought that it was for the best to to sort of get out of it because I yeah we just didn't know what was going to happen and um, you know to try and avoid a serious amount of debt or get you know putting ourselves in a lot of a worse a lot worse position um, in the future and. Look, I, you know, shed a few tears, had a little bit of a cry about it and had a slight existential crisis about, you know, everything I've worked so hard for over these years and the thing I always wanted to do, I'd finally done and now it's gone. Well, uh, we can talk about uh, your time in uh, Tasmania because you spent quite a few years at, at various venues, um, but you, you ended up going back to Melbourne in the last year, back to Victoria. Um, what was it like moving uh, states during the the last year and, and what drove that decision? Um, well, M Melbourne's home. I mean, I, I grew up from, or I grew up I from 16 onwards. I've lived here and, and worked here. Um, and so like my, my wife had moved to Tasmania um, after, you know, after we'd been together for a little while and we were doing the interstate thing. Um, again, it was all, it's all quite, quite lucky the way that all worked out she had moved down um the beginning of last year um in february for us to to set up our lives in tassie and she's she's a nurse um she you know works at st vincent's up here and she had before she moved and she'd come down and was going to be working at the royal and i had the restaurant and we were like okay cool this is this is going to be good we're going to set ourselves up and you know we love the tassie lifestyle we love the food we love the nature and how close you are to everything and we wanted to set ourselves up there. And so she'd made that big move. And then like, what was it? Probably like within the first month, COVID started to really hit. And, you know, I think it was March last year, I, we made that decision for me to get out of the, the restaurant. Um, and then I was unemployed for a little bit. She was moved down to work in the hospital. And then all that was happening was swabbing. She was, so she helped set up and, as quite fundamental in the establishment of the COVID testing center in Hobart and how that moved from in, um, in one of the re repatriation centers to a complete big outdoor drive through thing. And yeah, I think all of that, plus then, you know, she moved down and the idea was we can come back and see the family and friends. And I always made constant trips to and f to and fro. Um, and then it was kind of that, sort of sense of double isolation for us. Not only if we were in Victoria, we sure we wouldn't be able to see anyone because we'd be locked down, but then we were locked down in Tasmania with a body of water surrounding us. You couldn't go anywhere. I wasn't working. She was standing outside in winter as well, swabbing people in, in, in the near snow with a jacket on and freezing. And yeah, like they worked really hard and it was just, it all sort of just really took a toll and, um, yeah, it was it was a bit crazy, and then obviously the decision to move back was just kind of one where again we'd spoken about it a lot. And we're like, well, I wasn't working in hospitality for most of last year. I ended up working at Telstra because you know it paid me money, and I'm very grateful that I could get full time employment last year. Um, but then looking to try and get back into the kitchen um, again, very limited down there. Only more so because of COVID and people holding on to employees and or not taking on anyone because no one knew what was going to happen. And, um, you know, we looked, we just spoke about it. And we're like, well, maybe we should move home. You know, our family's all here. Our friends are here. Our close support networks are here. There's so many more job opportunities in Melbourne for me. And um, Ace could always go back to St. Vincent's, which she's done. And, yeah. 
Well, as you mentioned, you've uh, called Melbourne home since you were 16. Uh, tell us about when you first got interested in food and, and that sort of what drew you to a career in, in hospitality. Oh, far out. Well, it's it's, it's far from the, the classic story of oh, I spent all my time with mum in the kitchen and or <laughs> mum or dad was a fabulous cook and... You know, I just I was just so lucky that I got to learn from them and it was amazing. Like it's pretty much the complete opposite. Like my my childhood was a bit a bit of a tough one. Um I like my biological mother passed away when I was born and my grandparents took myself and my sister in, which was in some parts very lucky and in other parts led to more dra- uh, led to led to more trauma. Um we weren't need to go too far into all of that, but it was if you picture a pretty rough, bad childhood or upbringing, that was kind of kind of where I was, um, and home wasn't a nice place to be. Um, and then, so I, was, I basically hit my teenage years, and it, I, I was kind of a bit lost as what to do. I, I did army cadets and everything like that when I was a kid, and I think that sense of organisation, um, that structure that strong leadership and everything that was associated with that for me drew me in. And then it would come time to um, look at what was a work experience in high school. And I was like, Oh, I have no fucking clue what I want to do. Um, Like maybe I'll join the army because of this. And someone had just said to me, Oh, why don't you, why don't you be a chef? Or why don't you try cooking? And I was like, I mean, I've never thought about it. Like it never really, never really crossed my mind. Um, and they're like, well, um, this, so this is over in Esperance in Western Australia. Um, so right on the southeast coast of WA, not close to much, um, except beautiful beaches and very white sand. Um, <clears throat> but um, there was a place there called the Taylor Street Tea Rooms, which was like the place in town where everyone would go. So I got in touch with them and I was like, look, can, you know, can I do work experience? And they're like, yep, absolutely. And... Um, so I, I went and I got in and it just fucking blew me away. I was just like, this is, what is this? What is this world that I've just stepped foot into? It's loud. It's noisy. There's fire everywhere. There's people just, you know, cutting shit fast. <laughs> and what the hell? Like, it was just like, what, what is going on? But I just, I just fell in love with it pretty much instantly. And um, very, very also strangely enough, one of my best friends to this day, who's also a chef, Daniel Dobra or Dobbers as he's affectionately known. Um, so we went to high school together. I met him on my, pretty sure my first day of, um, of my work placement. Cause he also worked there and yeah, what's that? 17 or something years ago. Now we're still best mates. We call each other family um, and we're both chefs and doing all right. Well, uh, since then, you've worked at some pretty amazing uh, venues uh, in Melbourne and Tasmania. What's been the real key uh, kitchens and moments for you that have uh, triggered your career? Um, I think there's there's a few along the way. Um, Going from, you know, very humble beginnings at the Taylor Street Tea Rooms where there was a toasted sandwich section and poached eggs were done in a poaching tray in a big pot and things like that. Um, to move to the decision to move to Melbourne when I was 16, I left high school and, you know, cooking gave me a way out and a way to get out, get away from my, what was home and all that trouble. And I was like, how can I get further away? I need to move somewhere that does, has some really great restaurants. And it was Sydney or Melbourne. I, I chose Melbourne. I moved over here and got in touch with some people. There was a restaurant that then opened up in South Yarra called Le Bouchardie Parisienne, um, Dan Swalk was the head chef and a gentleman called Philippe O'Bron was the owner slash exec chef, I guess. Um, very French, very, very French. Um, and he was, but um, very hard to work for, very, very classic, very militant, but I loved it. That was a very big defining moment for me at one point or at the beginning where I started my apprenticeship and it, again, completely shifted what food was for me and what showed me what food could be and um, just the crazy flavors and combinations of different ingredients and making all your stocks from scratch, making sausages, cutting up meat, like butchery, like butchery, um, you know, terrines and just really classic technique that I've 
grown to love over the years and, and respect so much. But I guess the, you know, out of the, out of the frying pan into the fire, whatever it's called, it just went from one place and then joined, started there. And it was just like, I thought I knew or well, had an idea of food and I didn't. So I think that was, that was probably number one. Um, and then over the years, um, I worked for Ricardo Mimeso. I worked at um, SOS, which, which was a pescatarian restaurant um, in the city that Paul Mathis had. So he was the chef there. Um, I went there in my second year. And that was, again, that was a pretty big momentum shift for me from going from pretty classic um, French cuisine, stepping into um, not only Italian, but also pescatarian. It was like, there's no meat in the kitchen. What's going on? Um, you know, not even for staff tea, it was like a strict ban on it. But learning from this chef who, again, was incredibly hard to work for. He was, was an absolute hard bastard. But again, I, love, I loved it. It's something that just drove me to keep going is I just wanted to work for these people and, and learn what they had to offer. Um, that was a pretty big one as well. Just sort of learning about, you know, hand rolling pasta and cleaning so much fucking fish. Um, but as you know, it's, it's something I did as a, I was a second year apprentice where I can, could confidently say I can, I can definitely clean a fish or two. Um, and then fast forward a few years, um, you know, I was kind of hit this point where I was in my twenties and I didn't want to be working in really long hours in a restaurant anymore till late. And, you know, I kind of not lost that love or desire to work in fine dining, but I just wanted to see what else there was. And then I went and worked at St. Ali in uh, South Melbourne. Again, that was a pretty, pretty key player in, in my professional growth and um, myself as a chef learning to um, run a massive kitchen team. And then, um, so it was, I was the sous chef and Andy Gale was the exec chef and we didn't really have a head chef for a little bit. Um, at at South and then there was St. Ellie North and then there was a pop-up in the city. So I was involved with sort of floating between all three venues and having to learn how to, you know, manage um, a large number of staff and very busy, like very busy venue and high turnover. And um, yeah, there was just, that, that was also pretty, pretty key. And I think one of the biggest things that I think brought all this, back together for me was um, one of my good friends, Chris Terlicker has Blue Bonnet Barbecue. And um, I mean, we met through, as you'd, most of us do, just through the industry and became good friends. And I mean, I'd lived pretty close to Blue Bonnet and been in a lot of times. And he just started calling me up sometimes being like, Grash, Grash, I'm in the shit. Uh, you able to, you able to maybe, um, uh, yeah, like, uh, can, can you come give me a hand? <laughs> Um, and so sure enough, it'd be a random night of the week and I'd be literally sitting down to do something and I'd get the phone to go off and like, tell her, I'm like, yeah, mate, how you going? And he'd mumble on, I'd be like, what, do you need me there right now? And he'd be like, yeah, I'm like, all right, I'll see you in a minute. Um, and sort of going over and completely like oblivious to exactly what's involved with American barbecue and to do it well, I'd gone over and just rocked, rocked up and you know, like, all right, mate, what do you fucking need me to do? And I think learning, learning that, and I guess a bit more of the time and the patience and the understanding of the fire cooking with a live fuel and the way you, you can only control it to an extent, but you can't completely control it and learning how to work with that. And, you know, you can't just t twist the knob a little bit to turn it up or down. It's, there's a whole process to it. I think that really brought together a lot of my loves of, um, butchery meat in general and cooking with an open flame or you know methods around cooking with um, fire and smoke so yeah I think those were the probably the main key players prior to opening Harlequin you uh, spent time at Pilgrim in uh, Tasmania but also the agrarian kitchen which is uh, renowned across Australia uh, what was it like having that connection to the uh, the garden and the local growers and working in uh, the the agrarian? The agrarian was a pretty magical um, experience. Um, it's it's what took me to Tasmania. It's something that happened again pretty pretty randomly, I guess. Um, I I'd, I'd followed what um, what the you know what Rod and Severin do 
at the agreeing. I'd had their book and everything, and I thought this was pretty amazing. And I was like, if only they opened up a restaurant. You know, that whole the whole approach and ethos that they follow is is something I think we can all um, aspire to if we you know if we have the resource and the ability. Um, but even just being a bit more conscious. And I was in Tasmania on a holiday. I was in Franklin, and um, a lady I used to work with at St. Ali, funny enough, was, was there working on the floor. And I was like, oh, hey, mate, what's going on? And you know, we had a quick chat, and she was like, well, my partner's actually um, you know, going to be the head chef at the Green Kitchens restaurant. I was like, what? They're opening a restaurant? And she's like, yeah, um, she'll be here in a minute <laughs> if you want to have a chat. And I was like, yeah, no worries. So I ended up having a, having a glass of wine and a chat with Ali, um, who ended up being the head chef at the Agrarian. And... I was like, look, here's my email. Um, if you, you know, if that's happening, or maybe let me know because I'd, I'd love to be there. And she sent me an email. I sent through my resume. Um, I flew down for an interview um, for 24 hours and like went out, checked out the whole agrarian, met Rod and Severine and the kids. Like saw that went and saw the site. Um, and then I, you know, went back to Hobart and I went and ate at Fico when they first, like, not long after that opened. It was pretty fantastic. One of my favourite restaurants in Australia. Um, and flew back to Melbourne and I'd got the job and so I gave my notice and pretty sure within a month I'd, I was in the car and I was on the boat. Well, you, you're back in Melbourne now um, at the Bridge Hotel in Werribee. T- tell us about um, what you're doing there and what your cooking style is like. So at the bridge, we it's like a pretty large pub. I think we've got capacity around three hundred, so it's it's a monster. Um, what what we're doing there is we're trying to offer like I guess high quality pub food, not in the sense of like a gastro pub where we're trying to be leaning to fine dining or anything like that. We just want to do really approachable but flavorful um, pub food. In, it's in it's in volumes as well, like large volume as well. So it's not like you can spend too much time on every tiny element of the dish, but we want every component that's there to serve a purpose, have the right flavour, and you know make sense. Can you give us a, a couple of examples of the dishes that you have on the menu that kind of exemplify how you straddle the sort of world of the restaurants that you've worked in and sort of. Um, bring that to the pub environment? Um, well, I guess one dish that's, that sort of sit, sits in my mind is we just put a beetroot risotto one um, with this, as the seasons have all changed and everything like that. And that kind of takes me back to my time at SOS. Um, it was a dish that we sort of like a bit of a, close to a dish we used to do there. We, we did a beetroot risotto and just thought of that. And again, using that, that same technique and that approach to you know, doing a good risotto, not just a bowl of wet rice. <laughs> um, and, you know, getting, being able to produce that again in a high volume uh, establishment that's again approachable for the clientele. Um, and what else are we doing? We're doing a, um, doing a really nice braised lamb shoulder that's served with essentially a semolina gnocchi. Um, so we pan fry the semolina gnocchi and we've got this you know, this lovely, lovely braised lamb shoulder. It's, again, it's got that classic component of having, you know, you know, your nice brumoir of your veg through it, folded through right at the end. So you've got these lovely colours of these carrots coming out and this this, love, this beautiful, rich sauce that just coats your mouth. And then you're going to mop it up with these semolina gnocchi. Um, yeah. You mentioned that you moved to Melbourne uh, when you were 16 and the industry really opened your eyes to opportunity and, and something quite different. How, how different are you to um, the 16-year-old back then and the way that you see food and, and cook? Chalk and cheese, I reckon. Um, yeah, I mean, from when I first moved to Melbourne, you know, I was essentially this little bogan kid from the middle of nowhere on the, on the coast um, who thought the epitome of cuisine was the Taylor Street tea rooms with the bloody jetty out the front where people would go and fish. Um, you know, that was food to me or a can of Waddy's baked beans and toast, which still is the epitome of cuisine, if you ask me. But um, yeah, just completely different person. Um, I'm very grateful and thankful for all my time I've been able to spend in different restaurants as, as a patron and as a chef. Um, 
gotten to eat some amazing food and what it's really i guess the biggest thing is learning about just tasting everything trying everything don't be scared to try something different and eat a different cuisine or, or try different food um you know you learn to love a lot like back then i would barely eat anything you know i'd turn my nose up at most 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 things you'd ever put on a plate in front of me i was really fussy and now someone's like you want some lamb sprains i'd be like please that would be fucking great <laughs> like you, you got you got some grabeche or something to go with it like just let me have it or yeah um just completely different um you know and as well as a chef you know you start out you work in these places and the industry's changed a lot, which I'm also grateful for. Because back in the day, you know, it was it was, it was like screaming, yelling, carrying on, dodging pans, um, all the abuse, all the underpayment, the long hours, and the bullying, and all of that. And you know, you sort of start to become a bit of a product of your environment through coming up in that, and it has to hit a point in your life where you decide to change. And you know, you a bit I'm not a, like I'm not ashamed to say it but I'm not proud of, of how I was back then when I was you know you get that sort of bravado about you and want to be that person and I think one of the, my proudest uh, moments is to really step back and assess that and work really hard on changing changing that person and who you are and the way you teach and you know I'm proud to say I'm not like that anymore and I haven't been for a number of years and um, I'm finding to actually really see what see what makes your staff tick and how to get the, the most out of them has been such a such a huge change. You mentioned a really troubled childhood that you had growing up and you also referred to yourself as Gresh just a few moments ago. You haven't always been Clinton Park. Um, you changed your name when you got married to your wife's name. T- tell us about that decision and, and why, why you did that. Well, I mean, yeah, so a lot of people call me Gresh, like my wife calls me Gresh. I'm my surname, my, my my original surname was Gresham, um, or my maiden name. I think that's what it's called, right? Um, so my yeah, my maiden surname was Gresham. That's the, that was how I grew up, and everyone, you know, everyone's just called me Gresh for a decade and a half or something like that. But um, yeah, look, my my childhood wasn't great, and I don't really, well, I do now, but I, up until you know, my wife and and our family, I never really had a much family like I, you know kind of got got out of there got away and it was kind of just me for years and years and years and um you know came to, we we're getting married it came time to sort of talk about these things and you know there's all that there's always that age-old tradition of well you know um, the woman takes the man's name and you know I see myself as a feminist we are a bit of a feminist household and I don't think that it's anyone's right or need to to choose that for anyone else or it, I didn't feel like my wife had to do anything um, and you know she'd, she'd float that ear she's like well I'm not really keen on taking your surname because of what that sort of represents for you and you know trauma and, and hardship and well, like it was quite poignant and so I thought about it a lot and I was like you know hopefully we can have kids and when we when we do if we do and if we can but when we do um, what, what am I passing on to them? And I kind of looked at my surname and I was like, well, it's never done anything for me. It's, I think about it, I'm like, it's not really like this. It doesn't make me think of love and happiness and a welcoming home and good times. It makes me think of quite the opposite. And, um, you know, the parks, my, my family, my, my beautiful wife, she is the, the greatest thing to ever happen to me in the whole history of my life besides walking into a kitchen. Uh, it's the, they're the two most constant things I've ever had. Um, and I was like, well, your family, her family is the opposite of everything I had. It's they're loving, they're welcoming. They welcome me with open arms since the first day I ever met them. And they love me. I love them, their family. And so I decided that you know, I, I asked if it was okay if I took took her name and um, she's like, I'd love that. And her father then called me and, you know, welcomed me. He's like, Gresh, look, you've been family since day one. I don't need to welcome you really, but welcome to the family. I'd be so honoured if you took, you know, if you took the family name and he's like, that would be amazing. Make sure you let us know when it's changed so we can have a bottle of champagne to celebrate. And yeah, so look, it was a, it wasn't a decision I I took lightly or made lightly, but 
it was a decision that a lot of um, it was it was very easy at the end of the day. You've had a, an incredible ability to adapt and change from difficult circumstances and um, really make a, an impression with your career as well and, and change and adapt for a better life. What, what sort of advice would you give to people that are looking for change after the trauma of the last year and a half? Um, like, although it may seem scary, don't be too scared to try. Um, you, if you, like, I know it's probably quite cliche but you never know unless you give it a go if you don't put yourself out there and and really try for something you you're either well you're never going to succeed because you've failed because you haven't even started but and you know you haven't you have to really attempt it or if you want a career change if you if you want to move somewhere else if you want to go for this different job and or in a different kitchen or try a different cuisine or anything just just go out and do it. The worst that can happen is it, fa- it, you know, you fail at it or it doesn't work out how you want. And we're all still alive, which we're lucky for. You know, you still got your life, you still got your livelihood. You can still try something else. Well, you're now back in Victoria and um, with your family and uh, running a really big, successful uh, hotel. What, what what are you loving about the role that you have now and the life that you're living in in Victoria? Um. The team, I think the team that we've got, are, they're, they're, they're all such great people. They've all come from different walks of life as you know most, most, most of us do in the kitchen. But the team we've got, they're great. They're all such hard workers. Everyone always wants to learn and push themselves and grow. But everyone also just gets along and respects each other. And you can go to work and enjoy yourself every day. Um, but you know, when, then when the going gets tough and everyone's got to sort of dig their heels in a bit and push the fuck on, they're all right there doing it. So like it's massive credit to all of them for, for how we operate daily as a venue. Cause we couldn't do it without them. No way. Um, I love the food we're cooking. I think it's, it's been an interesting one, especially being in Werribee. Um, the other three venues in the group are all inner city. So, um, their offering a bit is a bit. He's a bit more tailored to their surroundings and, you know, even Marky Alon's in Fitzroy and um, Union House and, oh gosh, the other one. Um, why do I always forget? There's a complete mental blank there. Um, but, you know, they're all, you know, what, Fitzroy, Richmond and South Yarra are caught at like, and so their, their clientele is very different to us out here. We're almost regional. Um, and so, you know, what we, what we're doing is tailored to suit them a bit more and, um, finding that balance. I think the, probably the, the more, most fun comes out of finding the, where the, where we draw the line with how much we can push what we're doing to be a little bit more creative or a little bit different to what they would normally expect, but then I'll still go for it. Um, and then the lifestyle side of things, it's, it's nice to be able to hop in the car and, you know, within an hour see my mother and father-in-law like they live up at Mount Macedon so it's pretty close to us um or my sister or brother-in-law or or, you know my nieces and nephews um and even just friends like you know going to going to a game of the footy like I hadn't gotten to go to a game at the G in a while and I went to a game with my brother-in-law the other week when Melbourne played Richmond and just just being able to you know drive in park up walk into the MCG watch a game of footy have a beer and drive home and go to bed (laughs) like I think that's that's pretty awesome well, uh, it's been awesome having you on Deep in the Weeds, Clinton. Uh, we've loved hearing your story and I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, what goes on with the Bridge Hotel moving forward. Um, please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. Wonderful, mate. Thanks for having me. Hope you have a great day. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospital community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.